I'm going to talk about the fundamental constituents of matter to explain how everything around us is built up from individual building blocks. And through that analogy, we're going to talk about the Eightfold Way. This is a story which goes way back to the beginning of the 20th century, when the universe was a much simpler place. Back then, we thought that everything was made from three different things. Protons, neutrons and electrons. Now, there are a few other particles which were discovered along the way in cosmic ray experiments. Now, cosmic rays, you may or may not have heard of them, but you've certainly experienced them. Right now, in fact, particles are raining down on you from the upper atmosphere. High energy protons and helium nuclei hit the upper atmosphere and that energy is transferred into new forms of matter. These particles rain down upon us, they decay and they change into other things. At sea level, it's really just muons, electrons and neutrinos. But you go higher up and you get to more exotic forms of matter. And that's what the early pioneers did. They took their experiments up into the mountains in the Andes and the Alps, and they discovered things which weren't seen at sea level. Things called mesons, which had a mass in between the protons and the electrons, which is why they were called mesons, mesos for middling. They were thought to exchange the force between the protons and neutrons to keep them bound together in the nucleus. Then there was also the photon, the particle of light, which was predicted uh, by Einstein in his quantum theory in 1905 when he talked about the photoelectric effect. And then there was antimatter. Now antimatter really did throw a spanner into the works because antimatter was something totally different. It was essentially the mirror version of the matter that makes up atoms. Now, antimatter was discovered in 1932, and it was the anti-electron, or otherwise known as the positron. The anti-electron had a positive charge, whereas the electron had a negative charge. And it was thought that if the electron had an anti-partner, which was its mirror in every way, in, in other words, it had the same mass, but it had different electric charge and everything else, and then why wouldn't the proton and other particles also have that anti-version? So the world was fairly simple. Proton, electron, neutron, these mesons, which exchange the force between the neutrons and protons, and there was this mirror version of antimatter. That was pretty much it, fairly simple. That was until 1947. And in 1947, things got a little more complicated. It was within these cosmic rays experiments that we first saw the bizarre behavior of what we now know are strange particles. So these strange particles were behaving very differently to other particles that have been seen before. Now the first particles that were discovered were things called kaons, and they were the first evidence that we hadn't actually understood everything about the subatomic world. And in the 1950s, the advent of the particle accelerator led to an explosion of lots of different particles being discovered. It seemed that suddenly we'd gone from really simple to really complex again. And so physicists, as they do, started to look for patterns. They started to try and see if there were any commonalities between these different particles. These strange particles seemed to be created quite rapidly, but then they took a long time to decay. This led to the idea that maybe there were two different processes, one for the production and one for the decay. This thing, because of the bizarre nature of the interactions, was called strangeness. In 1953, Murray Gelman came up with the idea that there was something else being conserved underneath the hood. Something very similar to electric charge. Just in the same way that electric charge is conserved, the idea was that strangeness was conserved when the particles were created, but via a different process, it was actually violated when they decayed. And this gave an explanation as to why the particles behaved very differently. And so Murray Gelman started positioning particles according to this property of strangeness, the electric charge on the particle, but also something that was called isospin. Now, the isospin is a property which was developed very early on in the idea of the atom to try and explain why protons and neutrons both attract one another to form their bond to create the nucleus. Essentially, via this nuclear force, uh, they are treated as if they are the same particle and they attract each other with the same force. If you like, they're two different sides of a coin, essentially just with different properties of what they called isospin. It's got nothing to do with actual spin, it's just that the mathematics is the same. Now, using the idea of isospin, electric charge and strangeness, Murray Gelman started to place the different known particles into a pattern. I guess this is very similar to the way that Dmitry Mendeleev constructed the periodic table. Mendeleev had different properties of chemical elements. He had their reactivity, he had their atomic mass, and he also had something called valency, 
And valency, if you're not familiar with it, is to do with the number of other atoms that the element would traditionally bound, bind to. We know today that it's to do with the number of electrons in the outer shell of the atom. And so Dmitry Mendeleev used these different properties to position different elements on the table. As he positioned them, he noted that some of them didn't fit the pattern. And in fact, there were gaps left in his table, which he said would be the existence of as yet unforeseen elements. And lo and behold, just a few years later, these different elements were discovered. And in the same way, when Murray Gelman put these different particles into the different positions according to the three properties. What he discovered was there were missing holes. And what he noticed was quite interesting. He saw actually that um, these different particles seemed to lie on the positions that made up certain shapes. Things which were called octets and decouplets. Now these shapes were well known by mathematicians to exist within certain mathematical entities called symmetry groups. And these patterns showed that there was an underlying symmetry. So Murray Gelman and George Zwick came up with the idea that this symmetry hinted at a fundamental property of these particles, that they're actually made of something smaller, a smaller substructure. This led Murray Gelman to predict in 1961 the existence of something called the omega minus baryon. The omega minus baryon was a particle with a strangeness of minus three. Very strange indeed. Uh, it had a negative one charge and he was also able to predict roughly what the mass of the particle would be. And lo and behold, in 1964, at the Brookhaven National Laboratory over in the United States, they discovered the omega minus baryon with exactly the same strangeness and exactly the same charge. And from the discovery of the omega minus, we got the confirmation that the pattern that Gelman was using in the eightfold way was indeed correct. And from that, Gelman followed through and indeed did George Zwieg to predict that the underlying symmetry led to an underlying structure. And the fact that these particles themselves were actually made of smaller entities. These things were called quarks, which led to the quark model, which was one of the backbones of what we now know as the standard model of particle physics. Hi guys, thanks for listening, and if you really want to know more about particle physics or would like to play with more LEGO, do take a look at my book, Particle Physics Brick by Brick, which takes the whole analogy just that little bit further. Thank you very much for listening, and if you did enjoy the video, please subscribe, and if you really liked it, go on to Patreon and support the work that the RI does.